the viewpoint expressed by the exhibition and not necessarily the viewpoint and the opinions of the Irish Congress of Trade Union. Um, briefly, I'd like to say that I welcome the initiative of artists working with trade unions and wish it could be extended a little more uh, and is perhaps a lesson for this country uh, for the trade unions and the labor movement as well as for artists and the art world. Um, when I went over, which is uh, 18 months ago now, <clears throat> a little naively uh, I asked what the solution to the problem was and one trade unionist said, uh, we have a problem for all solutions. Um, but looking around for a consensus, I found a consensus on only one thing, I think, that is the necessity for a Bill of Rights um, as part of the solution to the problem. Um, the consensus stretched across uh, all categories, really all the political parties. And one interesting uh, point was that we do have on the video tape uh, playing during the exhibition uh, the case for a Bill of Rights uh, expressed by people in Northern Ireland working in the civil rights uh, movement. Uh, one thing that I hope the exhibition will contribute to is opening a debate on the whole issue of Northern Ireland um, and I would like, I would hope that the Labour movement uh, would participate in, in a, as it has been doing, uh, the TUC uh, as long ago as 1971 called for a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. Um, I would like cultural workers also to participate in that debate. Um, we've had from the Labour movement uh, several messages of support. Um, one came this morning from uh, Mr. Joe Gormley of the National Union of Mine Workers. And he said, the NUM welcomes the initiative of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions Northern Committee in sponsoring the exhibition. The NUM expresses solidarity with trade unionists in Northern Ireland and welcomes the aspiration for a Bill of Rights. Mr. Arthur Latham, uh, MP for the Tribune and uh, member of the Tribune Group, uh, became involved in the civil rights issue in 69, and he says, uh, all the ramifications of the problems in Northern Ireland have tended to overshadow the basic civil rights issues, and I welcome this bill because it does focus attention on these matters. We had a message yesterday from Mr. Ray Bookton of Aslef, uh, and he says, as left calls upon trade unionists to give support to the campaign to obtain a Bill of Rights for the people of Northern Ireland. Uh, Ken Gill from the TAS section of AUEW says, the TAS section of AUEW once again expresses its support for the Bill of Rights. Mr. Bernard Dix, General Secretary of NUPI, uh, says, I wish to express my support for the efforts to establish a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. Mr. V. W. Swift, Secretary of the North London District Committee of the AUEW, says, only this week in relation to this campaign and in support of the six points, the North, that's the six points of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions uh, uh, Better Life campaign, the North London District Committee of the AUEW has called upon the Executive Council of the TUC to take action to further the policies of the Better Life for All com campaign and the Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. Uh, Councillor Barry Duggan from Camden Council sends a message of support towards the efforts to secure a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. And David Wiley sent me a letter. David Wiley is the Cultural Secretary of the ICTU and is an area organiser of USDO in Northern Ireland. So as I wish you every success and that it will bring the tragedy of Northern Ireland to a wider spectrum of people. Uh, I'd like, now like to introduce uh, Lord Brockway, who uh, has sponsored uh, a Bill of Rights uh, several times in the Lords, uh, as recently as uh, four weeks ago, his last bill went through, um, to talk about the Bill of Rights. Thank you very much. First, may I just say a word or two about this exhibition? 
because I regard it as extraordinarily significant. Uh, to some it may seem strange that it should be sponsored by the Northern Ireland Committee of the Trade Union Congress and the Northern Ireland Arts Council. In, in essence, this is an alliance between the organized workers and those who wish to see a development of appreciation of, of art. The uh, architect or the artist of this exhibition is Conrad Atkinson, who is a fellow in fine arts at the Newcastle University and also chairman of the Artists' Union. Now, he has developed the relationship between art and life to a new dimension. John Ruskin, William Morris, protesting against the idea that art was merely a matter of pictures on walls or stained glass windows in churches or even statues at street corners. But what Conrad Atkinson has done is to apply art to our modern problems, to events, and to the history of our time. Uh, he began rather strangely, and one would think there was no relationship of art and wages, uh, work, and prices. He developed the idea of art to a strike in his own native village of Cleetamoor. And now he has applied art to the tragic and developing situation in Northern Ireland. We've heard of three act plays. In a sense, this exhibition is a three art play. Beginning with Bloody Sunday in Derry, and uh, I was there, just standing to speak at a legal meeting of the Civil Rights Association, hundreds pouring down that square, army vehicles behind them, shots and 13 dead. Act one. Act two, the hatred and sectarian killings and appalling bombings in Northern Ireland, which followed. Act three, the bill for the civil rights in Northern Ireland which is one contribution towards a solution of this situation. I have three times now introduced a bill for civil rights in the world. <coughs> it has been received sympathetically, even in the House of Lords. It has had certain consequences. A restriction of racial discrimination in housing under local authorities. A more recently a bill aimed to restrict discrimination in employment. The appointment of a commission under Lord Feather to examine this problem of civil rights in Northern Ireland. I never felt that that commission was necessary. First because there is extraordinary unanimity of opinion in Northern Ireland 
about the necessity for a bill of human rights. At the recent convention, despite its dissolution differences, there was absolute unanimity regarding the need for a bill of civil rights in Northern Ireland. There was different opinion about uh, how it should be introduced. Some wanting it to be introduced as a bill covering the whole of the United Kingdom. Others wanting it for Northern Ireland and Over. But no difference whatsoever between all the parties at the convention about the necessity for a Bill of Rights. And that not only applies within the political parties, it applies within all sections of the people in Northern Ireland. Not merely the Trade Union Congress, but uh, also among Ulster from, uh, uh, Protestants. On the last occasion when I introduced the bill, only a fortnight ago, a bill had already been carried for a Bill of Rights applying to the whole of the United Kingdom, Britain, and to Northern Ireland. My bill was for Northern Ireland alone because I took the view that while there is still, still discussion about a bill for Britain, there is unanimity of opinion about a bill for Northern Ireland. I received this undertaking at the end of the debate that the British government will consider carefully the proposals which are made by the commission of which Lord Feather is the chairman. is now in its last month of securing evidence, the month of April. It will almost certainly report its conclusions by the beginning of October. I am very hopeful indeed in view of the unanimity of opinion in Northland that the Feather Commission will report favorably for the Bill of Rights. If it replies favorably for the Bill of Rights in September, I hope that in the Queen's speech for the new session in October or November next year, the Labour government will include a pledge to introduce a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. We have, between now and the new session in the autumn, to bring the utmost pressure in favour of the application of the Bill of Rights. Let me just say this. I regard a Bill of Rights in Northern Ireland as more important than power sharing. Power sharing, yes, for the emergency. I'm glad of the initiative of Mr. Craig. I'm encouraged by the polls in Northern Ireland which have indicated support. But in the long run, for a solution of the problems of Northern Ireland, one cannot depend upon a coalition government. One cannot depend upon cooperation between the Ulster Loyalist Coalition, which is capitalist-orientated, 
and the Labour and Social Democratic Party, which is socialist oriented. Inevitably, if they are going to deal with the problems of unemployment, of appalling housing, of the underdevelopment of the west of Northern Ireland, there will be a confrontation between those two points of view. But what we have to assure in Northern Ireland is that there should be a constitutional basis by which no law and no administration which repudiates human equalities, the repudiation of all discrimination and normal civil human rights, that should be the basis of the Constitution and no law or administration which denies them shall be lawful. An emergency, yes. I have proposed in my bill that if there's a national emergency, it should only become operative if there is a two-thirds majority in the British Parliament and two-thirds majority in any new parliament in Northern Ireland, which may be established. But except for emergency, there should be a constitutional basis which would deny the 50 years rule installment, which brought about discrimination against the minority and which would guarantee those equalities. We have, before October and November, to mobilize support. <coughs> mobilize the support which these encouraging messages, messages suggest we should get from the Labour movement so that a bill may be included in the Queen's speech. If it is not included, then again, we introduce both in the House of Commons and in the House of Lords, private members' bills to secure this realization. And I am fairly confident, in view of the unanimity of opinion in Northern Ireland, and in view of the increasing pressure in this country, that even private members' bills may pass through Parliament. So I end with this hope, a hope of which this exhibition is a realization that the three act tragedy which there has been in Northern Ireland may at least end with this glimpse of hope for the future. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord Berkeley. Um, Councillor John Harmons uh, will now speak on behalf of the Labour majority of the Camden Council. Thank you, Mr Chairman. <coughs> I must explain that I only speak for the Labour majority because we have not had a council meeting uh, since I was informed of this conference, this press conference. So that um, it is, it would not be fair. Um, I can, however, say that in 1971, the Council did have a very considerable uh, debate on a motion on Northern Ireland, um, and uh, the, the, the motion was passed. I, I will, in fact, read you part of that um, in, in a moment. Um, I want to say that the reason why the Council is so concerned um, about Northern Ireland situation is, of course, because we have a very large Irish community here, both in, in Kilburn and in the Kentish Town areas as well. Of course, it's spread over the whole, the whole borough, but those are the main concentrations. Um, and it, we cannot uh, overlook the strain which the present situation in, in um, Northern Ireland must have on not only on the, on the people, the Irish people here, whose families uh, may still be in Ireland, um, but 
the strain between the Irish and the non-Irish uh, population because um, there, there must be a feeling among the non-Irish people occasionally when there, is, when there is violence in this country, oh damn the Irish, why don't they get out? And one can understand um, that some of them, especially if they have, um, uh, they, if, if they have relatives um, involved in these, in these violent situations, um, the feeling in this way. Now, that is not going to help all the people of, of Camden, and because of this, we are, we are naturally, professionally um, uh, in, uh, involved in it and professionally very deeply concerned. Quite apart from that, I myself have been most deeply concerned about Northern Ireland for many, many years, long before the present, the present violent situation arose in, in 68, 69. Um, mainly through, the, uh, through my um, involvement with the movement for colonial freedom, which is now called Liberation, um, to which uh, Irish organizations are, are affiliated. Uh, we have been concerned about the, uh, about the uh, discrimination, about the very great problems uh, that there have been in, in um, the six counties. Uh, because of that, I was in fact, uh, I went to, um, to, the, to, uh, to Derry uh, on the day, I went with Fen Broadway, to the civil rights meeting on Bloody Sunday. Um, we didn't know it was going to be Bloody Sunday. I might, may say that that was really the proudest moment of my life because I felt that I was really involved with the people of Ireland and I knew then, from my experience there, what they were experiencing. Before I had been outside it, and although I was concerned, I uh, did not really know what was happening. I don't think we in this country do know what any kind of war situation is like as much as the people who have been involved directly. We ha in Camden um, have obviously continued to increase our concern with the increase in, in, in violence over there and the increase and the violent um, events in this country too, for the reasons I have given you. More and more Irish people have come here. Naturally, they have joined their friends here. And the, the situation here therefore becomes, in a sense, more grave, um, because a lot of them uh, cannot find homes um, because we, are, we have problems already without uh, people coming in from, from other parts of the country, the United Kingdom. Um, while it is part of the United Kingdom, we have to regard it as, as such. And we therefore treat, must treat them, obviously, and we do treat them in the same way as anyone coming from any other part of Britain. Um, I, I would like just to read you the the, resolu the motion that was uh, part of this part of the motion that was passed um, in 1971 because we we do feel or many of us certainly do feel exactly the same um, as as we did then. This Camden Council, proud of the record of achievement in the field of community relations of many of our leading citizens expresses its deepest concern at the serious developments in Northern Ireland. The Council wishes to extend sympathy to all Irish citizens, whether from Northern or Southern Ireland, and whatever denomination, living, working, and making a valuable contribution to all the services in Camden. We are very worried by the possibility of a weakening of the excellent relationship Camden has, has with all Irishmen here or in Ireland and we urge the government to take immediate political initiatives to create an atmosphere in the six counties in which men and women could begin to discuss and work for a peaceful solution to the problems which can ultimately only be resolved by the, um, 
sorry, can't read it. By the reunification of Ireland by majority consent. We are therefore, because of the sentiments we've expressed there, and which we still hold, deeply concerned that anything which the Irish people agree upon in Northern Ireland shall be carried through. And the Bill of Rights is, of course, the one thing which they all agree upon. For this reason, it must obviously be in, our, in the interests of Ireland and of Northern Ireland and of Britain and of Camden that this one action by the government must be taken as soon as possible to bring in a Bill of Rights which, as Fenner has said, is the one way which can bring any hope of a solution to the problems which have gone on so long in the six counties. Thank you. Thank you, John um, I, I hope that uh, other local government authorities will take up the initiative that Camden has um, put forward. Um, we now have Jack Dromey, who is chairman of the NCCL, the National Council of Civil Liberties, and chairman of the Northern Ireland Committee of the Greater London Association of Trades Councils. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for over a decade, the NCCL has been in the forefront of the campaign in this country for a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. Now, the impetus for the Bill of Rights came originally from within the civil rights movement in Northern Ireland. And the civil rights movement saw the Bill of Rights as a measure which would do three things. First, uh, it would be designed to attack discrimination in housing and employment. Secondly, it would protect freedom of expression uh, and the right to organise. And thirdly, it would end the use, or rather the abuse, by the security uh, uh, authorities of the then Special Powers Acts. Now, in the last two to three years, the Bill of Rights has also become a major issue for the Protestant community within Northern Ireland, because there are six significant sections of that community have suffered from the use of special powers as they have come into conflict with successive, as what we call, last chance political initiatives by the British government. Now the NCCL welcomes the support expressed across the political spectrum in Northern Ireland for a Bill of, uh, a Bill of Rights. And it cannot be emphasised too strongly that it is a demand which com does command significant support right across the political and religious spectrum. And further, we would commend the initiatives taken by NICRA, the Northern Irish Civil Rights Association, and UCLAC, the Ulster Citizen Civil Liberties Advice Centre, which is an organisation based uh, entirely within the loyalist community uh, in Belfast. We would commend the initiatives that they have taken in, in publishing draft bills and campaigning around those draft bills. Now, the NCCL has itself given very detailed evidence to the Feather Commission on Human Rights uh, on the need for a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. In that evidence, we have called for the introduction of a considerably strengthened uh, European Convention on Human Rights into domestic law. That is, that the European Convention would become actionable in the Northern Irish courts. And further, we've called for the establishment of a constitutional court in Northern Ireland, and we have suggested that such a constitutional court should be presided over by uh, representatives of the European judiciary. It's not a novel or a revolutionary principle, it's something which in fact uh, has precedent both within this country and Europe as a whole. Now one thing we are concerned about with the Feather Commission is that uh, the deliberations of Feather uh, and then when Feather makes a report of the Northern Ireland office, will be used to delay the very real, very great pressure that now exists within Northern Ireland for the implementation of a Bill of Rights. Uh, it, we have seen, for example, over the last 12 to 18 months, the Northern Ireland office has continuously put off taking any initiative on the question of the introduction of an independence complaints machinery for the police by suggesting that an initiative cannot be taken in Northern Ireland 
uh, before an initiative is taken in the rest of the United Kingdom. And we are concerned that the same argument will now be used to postpone for a very long period of time the introduction of a Bill of Rights in, this, in, in, in Northern Ireland uh, on the basis that an, initi an initiative cannot be taken unless it is one that affects the UK as a whole. And we would uh, take, take issue with that argument. In our view, there is an overwhelming case for the introduction of a Bill of Rights now in Northern Ireland, and there ought not to be any delay in the introduction of such a bill uh, in the way that I've outlined. Now, having said what I've said, I think I'd like to make it clear on behalf of the NCCL, and I think this is the point made by Fenner as well, that a Bill of Rights is not in itself a panacea for all ills uh, in the Irish situation. And to a certain extent, we are concerned that the aspirations of both communities in, in Northern Ireland may not be met by the measure which they are likely to get. And I say that the measure that they're likely to get is that the, the government uh, may very well introduce or su suggest the introduction of the European Convention as it stands into domestic law, both here uh, and, and in Northern Ireland. And we are concerned that such a measure will not meet the demand and the nature of the demand that has been put forward for uh, a Bill of Rights in Northern Ireland over the last few years. I think it should be remembered that the, following the ratification by the British government of the European Convention on Human Rights in 1953, uh, the, the government has derogated on four occasions from the European Convention in respect of Northern Ireland on, uh, in 1957, 1969, 1971 and again in 1975 and the convention which it covers Northern Ireland did not prevent the use of, of, of torture or inhuman or degrading treatment in the aftermath of internment in 1971 neither has it prevented such measures as searches and the process which is called screening in Northern Ireland by the army a process that is now not operative with, with the exception of the um, area of South Armagh now it is true that certain measures that have been adopted by the British government since 1971, since their derogation from the Convention in 1971, are the subject of a challenge uh, in the European Court of Human Rights, uh, a challenge made to those measures by the government of the Republic of Ireland. But it must be remembered that all these things have taken place since 1971, at a time when the Convention did affect Northern Ireland, uh, and the, the Convention has had, unfortunately, precious little impact upon what went on. Now, I think we have to sort of face in the debate about the Bill of Rights the, the, what is likely to happen, and that is that it is highly unlikely that any government at Westminster will agree to a Bill of Rights which does not permit uh, it, the, the use of emergency legislation like the Emergency Provisions Act. Further, uh, even, even the, the European Convention itself allows for widespread infrin infringement of civil liberties for example, the provisions in respect of uh, the, free, uh, the freedom of expression uh, could be used in the interest of the preservation of territorial integrity, as it states in the Convention, to curtail the lawful and legitimate activities of those who call either for your, a united Ireland or for an independent Ulster. Now, a Bill of Rights, if passed, will not end the need for specific law reform in Northern Ireland. Uh, specific law reform is designed to safeguard individual liberty. For example, the making statutory of the judges' rules, which protect uh, detainees in police stations. Specific law reform, like the Fair Employment Bill, uh, which was unfortunately dropped in the last session uh, of, in the House of Commons and, is to be, and is, is, has been reintroduced in this session. And such legislation should and continue to be passed even when the Bill of Rights is on the statute book. Neither can a Bill of Rights detract from the need for political, uh, collective action to enforce legitimate rights. For example, the trade union movement has learned to its cost the folly of putting all, of, all its trust in princes and judges. Further, bill, Bills of Rights can never be a substitute for a strong and effective civil liberties organisation both here and in Northern Ireland dedicated to the defence of fundamental rights. Having said that, you know, a, a warning, that, uh, I think that we, a warning that has to be given, 
about the likely impact of a Bill of Rights because the kind of bill that Fella has so, has so excellently been campaigning for for some years, uh, unfortunately, is not the bill that, that, that I, can, I can anticipate the present Prime Minister and Cabinet accepting. Having said that there are dangers, therefore, in, the, in simply writing the Convention in, having said that, the NTCL's view is that the campaign must continue for a, not simply for just the convention to be written into British law, because that will not be enough, but must continue for the in, in, in support of the kind of initiative that's been taken by Fenner Brockway. Now, we see a Bill of Rights as an essential part, but of course, as Fenner has said, only part of a political solution to the problems of Northern Ireland. Because such legislation uh, will, not, will not work and will fail unless uh, the appalling problems of housing and employment are tackled simultaneously, problems that fuel the sectarian fire within Northern Ireland. Uh, for example, it's extremely difficult to make a Bill of Rights operate effectively against discrimination in employment uh, if, if unemployment is running at 12%, because in that situation it's not surprising that a worker will turn against worker to protect interests, however, however mythical those interests might be, against his fellow worker. Uh, so that, that kind of action, that the Bill of Rights is, is ought to be part of a strategy, a political strategy within Northern Ireland. Discrimination will therefore, in our view, continue to be part of the part or a fact of life in Northern Ireland as long as too many people are fighting for too few jobs. The Bill of Rights is an excellent and important initiative that the British government could take. And if only the government would recognise that instead of putting its emphasis upon uh, security solutions or solutions based upon cobbling together perhaps desirable but very difficult political alliances to govern the province and would look at the root causes of the problem in Northern Ireland such as employment, housing and the lack of, of, of civil and democratic rights and consider how that can be remedied by measures like the Bill of Rights then significant progress could be made within Northern Ireland. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jack. Um, I wonder if we could take any questions now. Has anyone any questions? Uh, well, then I suggest that, that what we do is, um, if, if no one has any questions, we could um, partake of some refreshment, and if you would like to meet the speakers individually and ask them questions, then we can do that. Thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. This was a presentation. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, we've had quite a, you know, quite a few people been interested in this. Yeah. A few uh, couldn't get along, but we'll cover this uh, anyway. Um, and I think it's quite you know, quite yeah. important to yeah. yeah. uh, Your point is about the exhibition is to reach the Irish community. Yeah, I was just going to ask Joan actually if there's. John, do you think there's any way if, if we could get some posters to come to the council that they could be distributed? Um, well, have you got any here? Uh, yes, we have. We've got yeah. I can tell you how many could you take? Oh, yes. We could give you three. Yes, I'm going to tell you what other the person in front of the ring who's dealing with it. Uh, I can see what we can do. We have plenty. Yes, yes. Well, if you'd like to give me a dozen, I'll get the person who's doing it. Oh, yes, exactly. Uh, the, the, you hand over the. the, 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 the Can I, can I take that poster? Yes. Yes, I'll get you okay. a poster. Yeah. Yes, there is. Right, Joan, I've got to get going. See you. Okay, see you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, do that. Bye, Fan. I'll say goodbye for you.